Welcome to Power Talks with Santosh sir. Today we have with us a special guest, Her Excellency Nancy Powell, the Ambassador of the United States of America to Nepal. Over centuries, millions of citizens from more than 150 nations have moved to America with a dream to pursue, and they have made America their home. Based on this integration of global citizens, religions, and ethnicities, today America has emerged as the world's leading economy, strongest democracy, hub of intellectuals, and the world's largest superpower. We have dedicated this episode to celebrate America's 233rd Independence Day. Your Excellency, how is July 4th, the Independence Day, celebrated in Midwest Iowa, your hometown? Uh, thank you. First of all, thank you for letting me join you tonight. Uh, the 4th of July was one of my favorite holidays growing up. It was always very warm weather, which meant we got to go swimming. We had homemade ice cream. We had a variety of very typical American uh, food, and we spent the day primarily with our family and friends in our, our small towns in Iowa. And then in the evening, there was a fireworks celebration. And that tradition gets magnified now that I live in Washington, D.C., with the perhaps the world's, uh, one of the world's best fireworks celebrations up at the Capitol uh, and the George Washington Monument. And it's truly a celebration of American independence and freedom. During America's new administration with Obama's leadership, what will be the major focus for Nepal and also the focus on South Asia? I don't expect many changes on Nepal. I think our policy is one that has been bipartisan. It's had support from both Republicans and Democrats. The focus is on trying to support the, the peaceful transition to a more democratic, stable, prosperous, and inclusive Nepal. There's been bipartisan support for our assistance programs, for uh, our education programs here in Nepal, and I think those will change. In South Asia, there's a clear focus on looking at the Afghanistan conflict, how you bring in Pakistan as part of the solution to that. Uh, I expect a continuation of the very strong uh, efforts to improve our relations with India, continue to expand those, uh, also to work with the region on terrorism and regional cooperation. Your Excellency, during the last decade, Nepal has gone through a turbulent time, and during this time, we have seen a strong role of international community. To what extent is it true that India lets U.S. decide its Nepal's policies? I think that is totally false. I think both countries have uh, interests in Nepal. They coincide in many, many ways, particularly in the most fundamental ways, I would say, of a desire for a democratic and a prosperous Nepal with people moving forward in, in economic uh, ways and social ways. But each country has its own priorities and its own policies, and I think uh, both of us pursue those independently. The Maoists still continue to stay on the terror list of the Department of State of the U.S. If we look at the last three years, the Maoists have welcomed the peace process. They have uh, accepted the role of the U.N. They participated and even won in the CA elections and formed a multi-party government. Cannot these signs be taken as a positive message from Maoists to accept democracy? I think these are all very, very positive developments, and I, it is the hope of the U.S. government that the Maoists will stay involved in the peace process and the democratic government uh, to be active participants in the drafting of the Constitution. Uh, they are blocking the parliament from functioning right now. Hopefully they will return to a role. But I think what is missing is that uh, the actions that their various groups take and some of their own rhetoric do not match those commitments that they have made to the peace process, to the democratic uh, governance of this country. And we are looking for a, a much closer match between the rhetoric, uh, which has been overwhelmingly positive, and the actions which continue, particularly in the districts, to be very violent. Uh, there was an incident just recently involving a school teacher who was very, very seriously injured. She's now in India. Um, getting treatment, but the YCL had targeted her without any judicial proceedings, without any explanation of what uh, their concerns were, without any resort to the police or to the judicial system. And those are the kinds of actions that we see over and over again that negate some of the very positive rhetoric that has come from the Maoist leaders. You have met and interacted with the Maoist chairman Prachanda a few times, who probably tops the list of Nepalese individuals on the U.S. terror list. Has he expressed a need to be taken off the terror tag? If this has to, how this can happen? We have discussed this. Uh, I've been very frank with him on 
the need to match uh, Maoist rhetoric and acceptance uh, rhetorically of democratic norms with the, the actions particularly of the YCL, but other groups as well. I, I am particularly troubled recently by the reaction of some of these groups to incidents in uh, in the valley. Uh, the Buns have become much more violent. Uh, people who in the past have been able to approach the hospital or diplomats or the press have been able to go about their work on Bun days. Uh, that's not been true in the last two that the YCL have enforced. I was taken aback last week when there was an erroneous press report that uh, again, the YCL joined into to a local protest and made it much more violent than I think it would have been in the past. So these are continuing actions that make it very difficult for them to be removed from our terror list. Out in the districts, we get constant reports of political parties, uh, the other political parties being harassed, being beaten up, being thrashed. Uh, and these are not part of democracy. Um, they, uh, abrogation of rule of law, the decision to take it into their own hands, uh, belies their commitment to multi-party democratic government in Nepal. Now that the Maoists are in the opposition, they have publicly threatened to resort to violence and resume civil war. Do you take these comments just as a political speech or is it serious this time? It's certainly troubling to see this, even if it is a political speech, that this is a tactic that they feel they need to use with their own members to keep them motivated. Uh, one would hope that they would be looking at much more positive developments. And I think it's, again, a, a match of actions and, and the other rhetoric of support for democracy that is, is of concern to us. That uh, I think all Nepalis, certainly all of Nepal's friends, hope that there will not be a resort to violence. Uh, you went through 10 years of sheer horror and no one wants to see a return to that. And uh, so finding ways to make sure that people accept democratic norms and they act according to those norms, I think is very, very important for all the parties. After the democratic restoration in April 2006, the army was sent to barracks and there, we sensed an apathy in, the, in Nepal security systems with the armed police force and Nepal police. We have noticed that in last three years, the human rights violations have seen a rise and several journalists have been killed during this time and which has blocked press freedom. Have you taken this issue seriously? This is one that was particularly highlighted in our most recent human rights report that is a worldwide activity, but in the Nepal report, we, we took it very, very seriously, particularly the attacks on the journalists. Uh, I visited Janakpur not too long after the Uma Singh murder. Um, I do not believe that the court case has proceeded in that, and I think uh, all of those who are looking for justice as a result of these horrendous deaths uh, are expecting the court system to react to the police and others to proceed with the cases. There have been a number of those. Uh, presses have been attacked during my time here. And in each case, we have tried to indicate that this is not what we consider to be democracy, that press freedom is a, a, a cornerstone of, of the ability of people to have information on which they can act, to make their vote, to make their voices known. And so we have been trying to work uh, with the journalists to strengthen their professional ethics and to make them better journalists, but also to, in, to help Nepalis protect the journalists and to understand how important this is to democratic development. On one hand, the security mechanism of Kathmandu International Airport is vulnerable. On the other hand, we, over the last three years, we have seen a rise in the small armed forces at the border, Nepalian border. Do you see this connection as a huge security threat in the future for the entire South Asian region? I don't know that there's an immediate connection, but I think uh, all of Nepal should be taking a look at the airport on any number of, of ways. It is the face for most of your visitors that come in, and um, it is not always the best face forward for Nepal. So. Uh, building up those facilities, making sure that they work expeditiously, that people are handled in and out, uh, would be a big boost to the tourism industry. Certainly there is a, at least one terrorism incident that has originated at the Tribhuvan Airport, and all of us take that seriously and believe that any airport in the world can be used for those kinds of activities. And if it is known that there is lack of security, it increases the chance for a repeat of, of what happened earlier. The groups in the Terai uh, are troubling. I think 
primarily for me, they are troubling for what they do to their, their neighbors. Uh, they are making it very, very difficult to have a normal life in the Terai. There are constant buns. There is a, a, a huge amount of extortion going on, disruption of business. People cannot maintain their factories, and then they let the workers go who no longer have salaries. So all of these things are very troubling as a result of these groups. Increasingly, they appear to have an upper hand, and we have seen in other parts of the world where this happens, you begin to have other groups that are not indigenous, perhaps to Nepal, take advantage of the, the vacuum that's created um, in a secure border between India and Nepal. Could be uh, exploited by others, that would be very, very unfortunate. I think we are trying to encourage regional partners to look at this issue to, for the Nepal government to um, improve the delivery of justice and law and order in, in the Terai. And these are, but these are going to be key issues for Nepal to address. Your Excellency will continue with our conversation after our short break. Do stay with us. Welcome back to Power Talks. We are in conversation with Her Excellency Nancy Powell, the Master of Finnair States to Nepal. Your Excellency, the sudden change in Nepal's government has sidelined the focus of constitution drafting. Will there be a pressure, a positive pressure from international community to make the drafting of constitution a number one priority? All of the international community would like to see the focus return both to the peace process and certainly the constitution is a very important part of that. But that pressure really needs to come from the Nepalis. Um, the concern of uh, citizens here to their government officials that they consider this to be very, very important will be much more effective than what the international community says about it. During the last five decades, Nepal has restored democracy several times, and despite the fact there are huge disparities within our societies. How important is it that this issue of inclusiveness is mentioned in the constitution where Madesi, Zanjat, Adivasis, Dalits and the women population are given equal rights and opportunities. I, I think from our own example in America, we know that having it in our constitution and as part of the amendments that we've made to our constitution is a very, very important part of the basis for using the judicial system, using our executive orders uh, in order to implement programs that help make inclusiveness and equality a reality. But we also recognize that it is a an ongoing process. We continue to, to struggle with this. My grandmothers could not vote when they turned 21. Uh, women didn't have the, vote, the right to vote in America at that time. There continue to be, uh, in my childhood, uh, most African Americans did not have the right to vote or they could not exercise that right. Uh, these are changes that have occurred over the past few years, but we continue to struggle with this. I think Nepal will also need very strong political leadership. It will need both the laws and the, the principles in the Constitution, but it needs to also be a change in people's attitudes to recognize the necessity of equality uh, as part of a real democracy in Nepal. During your tenure in Nepal, what has been the major focus of USAID? We've had two major areas. We've been working in support of the peace process, which has included uh, things like dialogues for the uh, various parties on, on specific issues involving the, the peace process and the 12-point pro program, other programs. We have also been working with the political parties, with the election commissioner, to strengthen the democratic institutions. Uh, we've had a program done at the Supreme Court just to work on making access to the court much easier for filing and uh, so that people could find their records, find where they are on the court agenda. Those kinds of very practical things on the democracy side. We're very pleased to have cooperated with a number in the international community, particularly UNDP, DFID, uh, the Germans, to set up the Center for Constitutional Dialogue, which supports not only the CA members and doing research and, and looking at various constitutional issues, but also providing um, English language training, providing access to the public for civil society to come in and have access to the same research materials and tools. And that's been a very important piece. I'm quite proud of the Women's Leadership Academy, which has been sponsored by USAID in coordination again with other donors at making it possible for the women members of the CA 
to have uh, training in very basic uh, leadership skills, public speaking. They've just completed a session on the budget in advance of the parliamentary session that will consider the budget. So they'll be prepared with what happens uh, in a budget session, how to prepare for it, how to have good questions and examine the budget that is presented. So those are examples in one area of the democracy and peace process. The other area that we have particularly concentrated on is health. And the area of focus has been maternal and child health care. Um, over the 50 some years that AID has been here, we've had a number of uh, very, very successful programs with the government of Nepal, with NGOs. And our role right now is to be the pilot programs to try out some new uh, and innovative programs. And then if they work, uh, to have the government take them over, expand them to all 75 districts so that all of Nepal can work on it. Uh, I had the pleasure of seeing one of those that involves uh, identifying respiratory infections in newborn babies. And if you can do that very quickly, the mortality rate drops very, very quickly. We're also working with safe delivery, uh, encouraging hospital deliveries, making sure that access in the villages to, to the tools for a, a safe delivery to help the mothers survive uh, delivery time. So these are important initiatives. HIV AIDS has been a focus, particularly helping Nepal to develop the structures that it needs to qualify for the global fund. Um, the United States puts 33% of the global fund money forward, and, but it has very strict criteria. Nepal was struggling to adapt to those criteria. I think uh, through our intervention, working with others, we saved $50 million uh, access for HIV AIDS and for tuberculosis. So those have been important contributions. That money would have gone to another country if uh, we had not made some of these interventions. So those two areas are also uh, pleased to have worked in the environment, uh, particularly with the community forestry user groups that in many cases not only provide economic livelihood based on the forest, but they've been sort of a local government. Uh, and their insistence that uh, two of the top four office holders have to be women, I think has been much more inclusive. They've represented the local community, whether it's Janajatis or Dalits or Brahmins and Chetris, whatever the community is, that all groups are included in, in, in the use of the forest products. Your Excellency, the United States also supports some 170 anti-trafficking programs in 70 nations. Has the anti-trafficking program been effective in Nepal, or is it a very complicated issue to deal with? It is an extraordinarily complicated issue here because Nepal not only is a, a country where women are trafficked into the neighborhood, but there is also, I think, a, a very significant increase in the number of particularly very young women who are trafficked here in Nepal and, and remain in Nepal. This has been an area of particular interest for me. I think uh, this is a, a very, very harsh future for these women. They, they live a very, very difficult life. They are essentially slaves. Uh, they are uh, open to risk of HIV, AIDS, of exploitation, and it is uh, a sad commentary on their lives if, if this is how they end up. And so we have been trying to work to communicate our concern, to work with various groups. There are a number of very active women's groups that are trying to help shelter women who have already been trafficked or who are the subject of domestic abuse and can no longer stay with their families. Also, very complicated issues of how you help these women uh, become educated enough to have a job that replaces their income in, in either prostitution or the dance bars, uh, how you train them to have a, a skill that others will employ them for. And to one of the areas that I was surprised, it's very difficult for them to find housing in Kathmandu that you can afford. So a lot of interrelated complex issues, uh, I think, uh, the efforts on behalf of Mighty Nepal and others of the NGOs to try to take uh, these cases to court where they have identified the traffickers and ensure that they are uh, prosecuted and, and end up in jail, I think is, is one element of it. Finding education and informing families. Uh, it is a sign of just how destitute families are that they tend to believe the stories that people who come to the village or relatives even 
um, tell the job opportunities for the young women that then turn out very badly for them. So it's a complex effort that's going to take a lot of education, uh, a lot of work. Uh, we have just recently issued our report on trafficking around the world. Um, we have a three-tier system, and Nepal is a, a two-tier country. Uh, this means that it, efforts are being made, but they have not been successful in handling the program yet. Uh, I think efforts to try to rescue the girls um, as they are trafficked in the bus parks or at the border are ongoing. Those are an, another important element, but it's also going to take a legal framework. It's going to take real attention by women leaders and others to this issue to, to make sure that this is not what happens to the young women of Nepal. During your tenure, we saw a rise or a special focus on the women empowerment program. What is the unique approach you take in promoting women leadership? Uh, I think I, I've been very, very pleased as I came back to Nepal after almost 30 years to see the, the very dramatic change in women's status, particularly here in Kathmandu. I understand it. It's less dramatic in, in, in areas outside the valley, but the young women uh, who are engaged in education opportunities that they didn't have 30 years ago is quite encouraging. Um, you see numerous women entrepreneurs and very successful ones. Uh, the magazines, the, the role of women in government has greatly expanded. So all of those were very heartening for me when I came back, and I think the real changes are going to come from those role models, those women exercising leadership. Uh, I've been pleased that I have a number of women diplomatic colleagues, and uh, we have formed a small group that uh, meets occasionally to look at how we might support uh, particularly anti-trafficking and women's activities. Certainly, I think for almost all of the donors, this is an area where we have all been trying to work to make sure that particularly education opportunities are available to girls. And I think we're seeing more and more of the results of that activity. You've been a teacher in the past. These days, not many youngsters aim to be a teacher. How important is it that we have dedicated teachers who can raise a generation who understands global responsibility? I am a firm believer that the teachers are the, the molders along with parents. Uh, it is very, very important to have parents who are engaged and able to help their children. But teachers bring the broad, broader world. And I would hope that it's a field that um, not only in Nepal and the United States, but around the world, we would attract the best and the brightest. Uh, certainly in my own country, we are working to try and in reinvigorate the teaching profession and make it much more relevant for our uh, particularly our inner city schools where the quality of education had, has gone down. I uh, remain very concerned when I hear in Nepal that teachers uh, take jobs, they receive salaries, and then they don't go to their schools. And uh, the young people who are in those schools do not have the benefit of an education that's going to be their ticket for a better future. I, I am very, very impressed with the sacrifices that are made by Nepali parents to try to overwhelm the, the problems that they see in public education in the government schools by either providing tuition for their students or getting them into a private school. And they're making sincere sacrifices. So I think uh, hopefully those sacrifices will be reflected in some career decisions by young people to go into teaching, um, looking at in my own government, I would hope that at some point we can bring back the Peace Corps to Nepal. Uh, Peace Corps had a tradition here for a, a long, long time of providing schools in very remote areas where it was hard to attract other people to come. And I hope we can return to that, that it will soon be safe enough in Nepal that uh, the government will welcome them back and we will feel that they can come back. I'm always reminded of a, a quotation from perhaps one of our most famous teachers. Um, it was a teacher who was chosen to go up in the space shuttle and lost her life in that endeavor. But uh, she used to say, I touch the future, I teach. And I would hope that uh, teachers in Nepal would see that as a, a truly important goal and continue their dedication to the young people of Nepal. Let us hope that someday we are able to raise a new generation who has more tolerance, harmony and compassion and they're able to create a better world. With this hope, I wish you good luck and goodbye. See you next week at the same time. Thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.